My name is Wolfgang Bernhardt. I'm a partner at Roland Berger. We are a global strategy consulting company and I run our what we call advanced technology center that besides other topics heavily uh, engages in projects with company active in the lithium ion battery value chain. So we have done more than 100 projects on the on advanced batteries covering the full va full value chain and major players throughout the eco ecosystem. So if we have worked with major automotive companies also on their raw, mater raw material securitization strategy uh, to, to define to what extent uh, engage in offtake agreements and direct projects investment in, in specific lithium and nickel. We have worked with more or less all cell manufacturers, a lot of the cathode material and anode material companies as well as with uh, mining and refining companies, for example, Finnish Mineral Groups a couple of years ago, where we helped them to build their battery strategy. Uh, Syra on the graphite side, uh, but also companies like us in Os Minerals in, uh, in Australia. That's a little bit of background. What I want to um, talk today is uh, about the, the industry in general, the, the trends that we see, the, and specifically on the impact on the, on the raw materials. First of all, a couple of words about the technology in lithium-ion batteries. What we do see is basically a, 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 continuous, a continuous development in um, more high nickel-rich chemistries um, that uh, is uh, are expected to, to, to dominate. So if we, if we ask ourselves the question, is there a, a risk that lithium-ion batteries and lithium-ion battery technology might be substituted, for example, by lithium sulfur or sodium batteries as, as uh, announced by, by CATL? The answer is no. There are certain applications where these technologies will come to the market. Sodium specifically for, for ESS, for stationary energy storage, allowing to basically um, uh, widen the, uh, the, the application of, of, of chemical energy storage compared to other storage technologies there. So it's going to dominate the industry. Um, uh, what does that mean uh, and what's driving it? It's basically driven, or the lithium-ion battery sector is basically driven by the adoption of uh, battery electric vehicles that in turn is driven by the need for decarbonization of transportation as well as technology progress that drove down the prices of lithium-ion batteries significantly in the last years. So what we can expect on a global scale is a share of around 45% battery electric vehicles in 2030. Massive increase uh, in Europe with more than 70% expected in 2030, but also in China and in the US with 60 or roughly 40% respectively. All that translates in a demand from our perspective of roughly 4,500 um, uh, uh, gigawatt hours in capacity for lithium ion batteries. Uh, that is our newest forecast. It's not yet complete, so we expect as we are um, in the process of, of uh, um, uh, recalculating the figures for commercial vehicles and energy st uh, and stationary systems, it's probably in the range of four and a half thousand, uh, but that are the current figures the, the next ones are based on. So four and a half thousand gigawatt hours of that, roughly 22% in Europe, or you could say more or less thousand gigawatt hours, and the same in the US, and a significant share obviously also in China. Um, that led to uh, the situation that we do see a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of companies trying to build gigafactories in Europe. Um, the announced capacity is now more than 1.7 terawatt hours, which is significantly more than that one terawatt hour needed. And a lot of that capacity might, might not be realized or can't be operated economically, as we also have seen. You might have uh, followed the, the, the news that one of the companies, British Vault, was close to bankruptcy, bankruptcy two weeks ago. And a couple of, uh, of uh, these other projects also will not, uh, will not sustain. They lack uh, the offtake agreements from, o from OEMs, they might lack uh, other customers and or they might lack the, 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 um, the competences to ramp up production at high yield rates in, in time and secure raw material 
at uh, which which they need to produce the to produce the batteries. Similar situation in the U.S. Also there, meanwhile, more than 1.1 terawatt hours is announced. Uh, and again, if you look at the figures, there are a couple of companies that are quite known and that will probably sustain. There are others that might pull out, as CATL, for example. And there are a lot that uh, might not even might not even lay crown to those new factories. Nevertheless, a lot of activities there as well. Having said that, um, while there is an overinvestment in cell plants, I would say the battery or raw material supply did not keep up. We we have heard about the price increases. You all know that. All know it even better. But it translated basically to an increase of cell costs of more than 30 US dollars per kilowatt hour even in the time frame between January 21 and January 22. That might uh, lead to a situation that OEMs revise their plans and increase the share of LFP that we estimate to be around 30% on, on battery electric vehicles in 2030, a little bit higher, uh, um, potentially using uh, technologies like manganese rich or others. Nevertheless, uh, that, that would impact uh, the demand of nickel, obviously, of nickel grade one, but would not have a big impact on lithium demand because there per kilowatt hour the, 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 sh the, the, the amount of material needed is more or less the same. It differs, however, from uh, the sources you use, you typically use or you, you use for the nickel, high nickel chemistries, lithium hydroxide and lithium carbonate for LFP. So with, with all that and with the increased political tensions, nevertheless want to build local supply chains, excluding Chinese and Russian companies from, from partner long lists. I don't go through all of these. If you want, I can uh, give you a copy of the presentation that should also uh, look nicer than this one. I obviously um, missed to download the, the, the right font on the presentation that's not available here on the laptop. That's why uh, there are these strange breaks in, in, in uh, in the action title. But important here is uh, uh, in order to, to deal with the geopolitical risks, there are lots of uh, activities to basically localize the supply chain and that are also driven through respective legislation. Um, why is that the case? If you look at that, um, if you look from a mining perspective, um, the, 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 the Chinese, uh, there's a huge Chinese uh, uh, operations and that, that does not include, uh, it's only uh, in China, that does not include the ownership of mines, also or, or yeah, partial ownership of mines in those countries. But also, materials processing is uh, basically um, uh, is basically uh, concentrated in China. So to build up those supply chains, those regional supply chains, alone for the supply of the U.S. and, and the European Union uh, demand and. Uh, an investment between 140 and 170 billion dollars is needed until 2030. And that is now based on those 2,000 gigawatt hours. If you scale it up, you can, uh, as, a, as a high level estimate, double the figures on a global scale. So significant amount of money is needed, um, specifically for mining refining conversion, but also for the production of the cathode materials and the, and the precursor materials that also do not keep up uh, as we speak with the uh, with all the announced cell manufacturing capacities. Let me switch, uh, 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 look a little bit deeper on, on the regulation side. Uh, a very important topic is the, the Inflation Reduction Act and, and, and a, lot of, uh, a lot of you have probably looked in that and heard about that. But in a nutshell, it means that it's significant subsidies in, in the form of, um, of, tax, uh, uh, of tax credits. Uh, if certain requirements are fulfilled. Um, there is a tax credit of up to 7,500 US dollar per vehicle um, if uh, the, the um, material or if the battery supply chain is um, focused on countries that are either the US or countries where the US has a free trade agreement with. So if, uh, for example, 80% or it requires to, to, to get the, to those subsidies of up to 7,500 US dollar per vehicle. In 2030, 100% of the components need to come from the US, and 80% of the critical minerals need to come from those free trade countries, and nothing 
uh, should come from from countries uh, of, of for what they call foreign countries of concern, which is basically China, uh, it's it's um, Russia, uh, it's. Uh, it's, for example, um, the Iran, but not relevant here, but China and Russia are the most important ones. And the free trade countries, most important ones, Korea, Canada, Australia, um, but also Chile and uh, Morocco. Morocco here, interesting for, for cobalt, for example. So 7,500, uh, half of that tied to the critical minerals, which if you assume, let's say, between between 50 uh, 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 vehicles, between 50 and 75 kilowatt hours, it's 50 to 75 US dollars per kilowatt hour. That is a subsidy that is above the cost of the, significantly above the cost of the raw materials and significantly above the cost of cathode materials and even in the share of, um, um, of, of, the, uh, of the whole material costs of a, of a cell. And if you add up then the additional subsidies, uh, specifically the 40, 40x requirements that give another $35 per kilowatt hour uh, on a cell level in, in subsidies directly to the manufacturers and 10 for the pack and 10% for all the investments in the uh, active materials, um, then you can imagine that basically the US pays the whole battery for those companies that have this fully compliant supply chain, which makes it so important. I skip that, that's a little bit more details um, in, in the long presentation. Um, on the other hand, we do see that China already has secured num numerous equity stakes in raw material mining and refining to achieve their electromobility ambitions. And all those assets that are majority owned, that do not, would not comply to IIA even if they are in, in countries that, um, uh, that are where, where the US has a free trade agreement with. So that, that's important uh, and that's uh, to be seen on the other hand. Now let's uh, some, some quick look on uh, where, are we, where are we today and or maybe in 2030, you can argue about all those figures there from Roskill, IAA and, and Statista, but uh, what, what we do see is that uh, for the expected EV production in, in the US, about 500 kilotons nickel are needed, uh, and that will most likely not, be, uh, not come from um, uh, those uh, uh, countries where the US has a free trade agreement with, specifically Canada and Australia. Um, also, depending on the processes used, uh, I did not uh, I did not show because we, we are, as I said, we are recalculating our, our nickel supply demand balance. Um, but in any case, uh, most of the resources or, or the most of the projects that are that come online um, come from Indonesia, and those laterite processes have a significant uh, uh, versa CO2 emission typically. Uh, than the sulfide processes that, that we do see elsewhere. And uh, that also has a big impact. Uh, for example, premium OEMs here in Germany, they, they have set a target of 25 uh, kilograms uh, CO2 emission per kilowatt hour on a cell level across the whole supply chain, which is close to impossible if you, if you don't include um, recycled materials, but puts the bar very high. Does that mean they will pay more for, for the respective resources? Probably not, um, but they will try to push their suppliers in that direction very clearly. And therefore, I think those processes um, or those projects that we sometimes see in, in Indonesia might not, might not qualify. If you look at the, uh, for example, at the, at the big projects that CATL or the big project that CATL is doing with Indonesia Battery Corporation with an investment of, eight, uh, of, of six billion dollars in Indonesia. Uh, the, 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 the smelter in the mine is fully operated with coal and has uh, emissions that are far from, from being where they should be. Uh, looking at lithium, the, we, do, we, we have done a rough overview on, on, on that. Again, that might change a little bit, but we do see a general, the general supply situation also especially tight for lithium um, and uh, uh, basically fluctuating around, uh, 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 around zero, the balance. Um, and a lot of, uh, uh, if, if we then look um, more from a European perspective, it's also clear that 
because of the uh, because of the reserves um, the, um, the that we do have in in Europe, uh, there is very limited uh, possibility to do so. Uh, we expect roughly, and that's in the middle, uh, 40,000 uh, gigawatt hours demand. We, we expect roughly 600. Um, 80 kilotons of lithium carbon equivalent uh, that's needed in Europe. Mining output is only 119 with feasible projects that we do see, and, and refining with integrated and non-integrated uh, processors is about 410. So there is a need to import uh, and also a need to build up the, the PCAM and CAM capacity significantly. What are the cell manufacturers looking at and the automotive OEMs when, when basically buying cathode materials and that also translates then obviously to, uh, to the raw material side. Uh, we did a survey in September with, with 12 different companies among, among them and on, on the sea level among them the, the largest Korean or the, the three large Korean players LG, Enersol, SK on and Samsung SDI but also uh, Chinese players like CATL, Asphalt and Goshen. And some of the new players here in Europe, like Powerco, which is a subsidiary of Volkswagen, ACC, which is the Stellantis, uh, which is the Stellantis um, Mercedes, uh, and and um, uh, 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 Stellantis Mercedes tot Total Soft Joint Venture, uh, Verco, which is an independent company that has a, an offtake with Renault and Northvolt, uh, the 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 player in in Scandinavia that already works with Volvo in, in a joint venture and with other companies as well as two or three smaller ones. What was very clear is that despite uh, uh, price, the most important criteria uh, for selecting a cathode material supplier uh, and that in turn should, uh, should drive their selection of partners upstream is beside the price and processing cost, securization of raw material, low CO2 emissions and compliance with the IRA ob objectives. Less important uh, and not shown here on the slide is the question, is, are these cathode material manufacturers vertically integrated? Do they have material innovation, the right portfolio, etc.? So again, also from, a, from the perspective of the OEMs and the cell makers, uh, securization of raw material supplied compliance with um, uh, IRA and low CO2 emissions are very important. What does that all mean? What are the strategic implications? Uh, from an OEM and cell maker perspective, not securing the supply of raw refined materials could ge jeopardize the OEM's business model. If they don't have the, the materials, they will not be able to produce. That's also the reason why we do see that massive amount of offtakes and, and project investments in the last one and a half year, I would say. Uh, we did this, we, 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 we did an in-depth analysis um, on, in the 2025 timeframe in June. There are already 40% of the available lithium and, and nickel supply was reserved by uh, 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 offtakes or project investments from mainly uh, cell manufacturers and, and cathode and, and PCAM producers. Um, meanwhile, it's significantly more, significantly more um, uh, um, at least MOUs have been closed and investments have been, t uh, have been done. So probably now the, the amount is more in the 70% range and those companies that do not have those offtakes might, might face a problem. Um, at the same time, um, there is, uh, 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 from, from, from the perspective of the OEM, the benefit from subsidies, specifically in the US, uh, but also a, a certain reduction of, of risk ex exposure. And uh, there's a need to secure supply through upstream partnerships. Um, now, everybody has done that, but uh, in between uh, steps are somehow missing. So uh, we do see those offtakes where, where with, with various mines or even, uh, or even the processed products, but whether that all fits to the requirements of the cathode and PCAM producers uh, is not clear at all. And I know from, from the discussions I have with OEMs that this is still an open point. What does that now mean? Um, what are the opportunities? We, we believe that integrating conversion, refining, and if we talk about nickel sulfurization, also through partnerships, provides opportunity for premium somehow tailor-made um, uh, uh, salts and sulfate that have the right level of contamination. 
and then uh, it should also give the opportunity to capture a fair share of the significant value, for example, of the IRA 30 uh, critical mineral benefits. So we believe there is an opportunity basically for a premium from, um, from resources that come from the right, um, um, uh, from the right projects and the right countries. Uh, and uh, that means also that while, for example, lithium OTAs are currently typically close at 95% uh, of index price, there might be a, an opportunity for a premium or an opportunity for a sale of a project to, to one of those players. That's all what I wanted to uh, show. I'm open for discussion um, and, and questions. So, um, uh, hap happy to go deeper in whatever type of topics you want. Yes, please. Thanks, Wolfgang. Again, a good presentation there. It would be great to get your slides, because there's a lot of information on that to digest. So if one-to-one -one could share that, that would be fantastic. Um, you were very quiet on graphite. Yes. Everybody talks about lithium and the big supply gap in, in lithium. Graphite, in my view, has got, if not a bigger gap, ahead of it. What's your views, please? Uh, what's a few? Yeah, I, I did not talk about graphite. I did not talk about cobalt. I did not show the 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 the, the gap we expect for lithium. Uh, for for graphite, yes, I would say yes and no. We have basically two two sources: natural graphite and and uh, and uh, artificial graphite. Uh, artificial graphite today coming nearly 100% out of China. Uh, natural graphite with some projects uh, now with Sura in 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 in. in uh, uh, in, in, in the US, in the south, uh, south of the US, uh, producing outside. Uh, I would say yes, there is, if we look at that, there, there is also a gap depending on the, uh, on the share of, of uh, natural and synthetic graphite. But at the same time, there's also um, a significant opportunity that um, by means of using higher shares of silicon in even um, natural graphite uh, 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 materials that are used already today as anode materials, you could increase the, the capacity of the anode side, which in turn means you need less graphite uh, for the same amount of, of gigawatt hours. So, so there is a very big, um, much bigger than, than on, the, on the cathode side, on the anode side, there's a very big uncertainty driven by um, uh, technology. So I would, uh, that has to be kept in mind, I would say. In, but if, if, if we assume that it's the same shares in silicon as we have today, then there would be also a, a, an undersupply. Yeah. Can you see any possibilities for technology change to go away from lithium to other materials for mobility applications? Um, yeah, let's let's maybe start with with fuel cells, yeah? <laughs> because fuel cells is is always is always a discussion. Um, we do see fuel cells in potentially in certain applications for for long haul commercial vehicles, um, but not in passenger cars. Why? Uh, today, uh, the for example the 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 the. Uh, the, the Murai uses, uh, as, as one of the, the cars that's already sold as a fuel cell vehicle, uses 19 grams of platinum in the membrane electrode assembly per vehicle, 19 grams. Now, if you multiply that by 100 million vehicles per year, you add 190,000 tons which is the supply of platinum. <laughs> so, so and, and then you can, you, can, uh, you obviously can, uh, uh, you obviously can um, recycle it, but it, it, that's one limit. The other limit is green hydrogen. Um, the, the, the green hydrogen is scarce and is needed for other, for other processes, for example, for cement production and steel production to decarbonize that, uh, and, and not for, I would say, not for transportation. And then third, as long as it is scarce, the question of energy, of the efficiency of the conversion processes from, from uh, renewable energy, solar, wind, to hydrogen, transport that, bring it back, uh, and then process it in the, in the fuel cell and, and get finally the torque to the, to the road is 17% compared to more than 90, 95% with pure battery electric vehicles. So that doesn't make a lot of sense. Then secondly, um, sodium ion, we talked uh, briefly. 
uh, for me, the simple acid test is would CATL believe that they, that they would uh, replace all lithium-ion batteries with sodium and at the same time buy a lot of invest, uh, do a lot of investments in lithium mining? Probably not. So um, what, they, what they were proposing was a mixed pack, two chemistries, e uh, um, sodium on one hand and lithium-ion batteries on the other hand. Uh, but even that did not get a lot of did not get a lot of feedback. I think it would work and can work um, for stationary applications because there the energy density doesn't play a big role and the cost of a sodium ion cell is expected to be around 40, 30, 40 dollars per kilowatt hour, significant lower than with LFP, uh, and uh, therefore it makes sense there. Then third. Um, Next generation technologies, also, uh, the whole solid state stuff also uses NCM, uh, the same type of cathodes, no impact on the raw materials. Lithium sulfur, uh, next technology um, in line, I would say, to commercial commercialization, would still need lithium, but much less. And sulfur uh, in certain forms that where the supply chain needs to build up. We probably see that technology in this decade already in commercial applications, but mainly for defense, uh, so drones basically, because uh, of the very limited cycle, cy uh, cycle life, a couple of cycles. But uh, a, a drone in, 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 in a military application might not need more than 10 cycles, yeah. <laughs> or might not, might not need to last more than 10 flights, and cost doesn't, do not play a role. Probably a technology or potentially a technology for the next decade, I would say. But that's, that's it. Then there are other, there, there's zinc and, and some, other, some other stuff. All that um, probably not relevant in the next 15 years. So from, from an investor's point, there is a low risk that if someone invests in lithium, that uh, technology change would come so fast before the lithium mine could potentially be exhausted. From my perspective, yes, <laughs> and I, and also personally, I have the same perspective. I can tell you so. Okay. Any other questions? If nobody else has one, I have another one. Yeah, please. Uh, could you tell us a little bit how you see direct lithium extraction and what's happening in this area right now? And is there a large potential probably to apply it on oil and gas wells and the remaining lithium, low level lithium? Could that change the quantitative economics it, here? It can, it can change, it can change the, the, the balance uh, specifically towards the end of the decade, I would say. Uh, and uh, I believe, and there are, there are a couple of, of, of methods, uh, there are methods already in, in uh, in, uh, in use, and there are a couple of uh, a couple of new approaches that that might be interesting, uh, specifically for that and other type of primary sources. So it's 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 an additional opportunity. And some figures I have seen look look pretty uh, look 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 pretty attractive, but also need to <laughs> need to show that they that they really work in daily life. But I think it's something to be looked at, definitely. Anyone else? Uh, I have a question for you, actually. Um, it's relating to ESG uh, sustainable criteria across the value chain, provenance, and how that impacts the automotive OEMs, because there's a scramble for the resources now, right? Yeah. And maybe you covered this in your presentation. I had to be out, so sorry if I missed it. But we have this scramble for resources, lots of off-take deals, et cetera, picking up now. Um, can Volkswagen or whoever uh, buy cobalt from DRC now because they need the resources, or is it going to really constrain the the options for where they can source these minerals from the ESG piece? Please. What you see is that uh, to be, uh, there, there are different, and, and I talk about the public stuff. <laughs> uh, BMW sources directly from from or has an agreement in in Congo, but uh, also with a very with a very tight. Um, framework regarding ESG and, and also securing that uh, through, through kind of apl application of blockchain technology that, that those uh, minerals come from the source that they are claimed to come from. 
Uh, I know from others, other OEMs, that they avoid to do that directly in order not to come in any discussions, but then work uh, through, through, through an offtake with, with one of the large Chinese companies that, that in any case has a very good reputation when it comes to, to ESG in Congo. Uh, I, would, I would also say uh, there, there is a way to, to invest uh, sustainably in Congo. I think that's, it, it doesn't make sense to, 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 to say Congo is all bad, but uh, it's, it's, there's a risk that it gets in, in whatever type of shitstorm. So, so that's uh, a topic. At the same time, uh, I know from those, those OEMs that do direct investments and offtakes that they also build up local um, local resources to have an independent perspective to what extent and whether the agreed on ESG criteria are met and not only to look at the paper but at the real projects. And, and this, will, this will play a bigger role. This is why I do believe that even if there's probably enough nickel uh, to be converted through an NPI, uh, from NPI through the Xinjiang process, uh, the, the, the ES, the, the CO2 emission profile is so bad that it's not an option for, at least not for Western uh, OEMs to use that uh, because it would completely destroy the, 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 the CO2 footprint of a battery pack. Um, that does not mean that's not used in China. It will be used in China. Okay, unless anyone has any other questions for um, Wolfgang. Thank you very much.